morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Round. Good morning. Good morning. The food will still be there. Um, today's presenter is Dr. Kimberly Dunsmore, our brand new chair of the Department of Pediatrics. She is a pediatric hematology oncologist by training. She trained at Duke University prior to joining University of Virginia for many years, where she served in various capacities, including Division Chief of Department of Hematology Oncologist and Associate Chair of Program Development. She is a nationally known researcher, presenter, and author. Her areas of interest include T cell, leukemia therapeutics, innovative ter ter treatments for pediatric cancers, and T cell dysregulation. Please welcome Dr. Dunsmore. Good morning, everybody, and um, thank you for inviting me to talk this morning. Um, it's my second Grand Rounds here, so um, still trying to, to work through a 7.30 in the morning breakfast Grand Rounds. That's unusual for me. So today we're going to talk about T-cell acute lymphocytic leukemia. It's the other ALL, um, and it's a teleserendipity trial and collaboration. So my disclosure so slide, sadly, I have no relationships to disclose. And here are your learning objectives for this uh, talk. So understand the differences between B-cell ALL and T-cell ALL. Understand the prognostic indicators in T-cell ALL. And understand the clinical trial strategies used to improve outcomes for T-ALL. So I usually like to start with a clinical case for a grand round. So I'd like for our residents and our medical students to help me out with this. So we have a 14-year-old African-American male coming into our ED. He's got a history of two-week history of cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, and pallor. All right, so you go in and you do an exam. And on exam, you find that he has a temperature of 38. His pulse is 120, respiratory rate is 30. Blood pressure is 120 over 80, and he appears distressed. On your exam, you find that he has wheezing, he has splenomegaly, he has cervical and inguinal adenopathy. All right, what would you like to see on some other parameters for him? Lab parameters, radiology parameters, anything you'd like. Tell me what you'd like. CBC, okay, so we do do a lab evaluation. Okay, with a different result, thank you, all right. Um, during that blood draw, would you like to get anything else perhaps? I have a feeling he'll need a blood smear as well. Okay, okay, that's a good feeling. Um, coagulation studies, anything else? Excuse me? Tumor lysis lab. I don't even need to be giving this lecture then. <laughs> All right, so the CVC white count is 200,000, hemoglobin 7, platelets 12,000. Normal or abnormal? <laughs> abnormal. Chemistry, sodium 132, potassium 5.5, bicarb 26, BUN creatinine 15 and 1.6, uric acid 12, LDH 827. Normal or abnormal? Abnormal, right? Okay. So then you, you actually ask me for a chest x-ray as well since he's wheezing. And this is what you find on his chest x-ray. So what does that what does that indicate to you? Consolidation. Consolidation. Okay, it's in the middle though, right? So mediastinal widening. Okay. So maybe a reason for his wheezing on there, correct? And then that blood smear comes out just like you wanted, and that's what you see. And what do those look like? Black. Okay. So this is acute lymphocytic leukemia in its presentation. It's the most common malignancy in childhood. And remember that for pediatrics, 85% of all leukemia is ALL and 15% is AML, acute myelogenous leukemia. And it's actually exactly flipped in adults. So more adults get AML than they do ALL. And for children, the event-free survival is excellent, but with a caveat. So this is why I love being a pediatric 
hematologist oncologist, pediatric oncologist. This slide depicts our increase in survival with every single clinical trial that we've run, starting with its initiation in 1968, where our event-free survivals for AOL were less than 10%. With every iteration of clinical trial, we have increased survival so that the last iteration, we're, we're now in a new iteration, but the last one that we can measure, our event-free survivals are at greater than 90% for this disease. And this is where collaboration comes in, all right? This is not something that one person could do, one institution could do. This is about collaborating across a broad spectrum of disciplines to achieve an awesome goal. And during that time, we not only looked at outcomes, we not only looked at treatment, we tried to understand more about what ALL was, what the biology was, what, what kind of things factored into prognosis so that we could actually figure out what kind of treatments might be better. So this is a hard slide to read, but we looked at demographic and clinical features, such as age. And so a favorable factor is having an age uh, from one, you have to be at least one, to less than 10. An unfavorable is less than one or greater than 10. And you'll see that all over on your boards all the way up until you become what you're gonna become in your working adult life. And that's part of the NCI risk group stratification. Females have a more favorable prognosis than do males. And race or ethnicity group actually comes into play. So white and Asian have a, have a favorable prognosis compared to black, Native American, or Hispanic. And some people might say, well, why is that? Socioeconomics, access to healthcare, it's not that. It's pharmacogenomics. It's actually how people process drugs based on their ethnicity grouping. So initial white count is very important. If it's less than 50,000, you've got a great, well, you've got a very good prognosis. If it's higher than 50,000, your prognosis is worse. Again, part of that NCI risk group definition. Then we have done a lot of study of the biology. So looking at genetic features or biological features of the leukemic cells. And for this, we collaborate with scientists all over the world to do this for the last 50 years, 40 years. So if you have B-cell lineage ALL, that's favorable. If you have T-cell lineage ALL, that's unfavorable. And cytogenetic features that everybody is asked to look at, so favorable or ETD runks one mutations, hyperdiploidy, and favorable chromosome trisomies, 4, 10, and 17. The unfavorable ones are the ones that we all learn about, PCR ABLE1 or PH Philadelphia chromosome abnormalities. MLL rearrangements, and hypodiploidy. And recently, we've, um, we've discovered a whole range of pH-like alterations that also confer an unfavorable prognosis. These are used to help select the kind of treatments that we need to be successful for a patient. And the genomic features are ERG deletions, which are favorable, and then Icarus deletions, which are unfavorable. Chromo Philadelphia chromosome-like, as I talked about previously, ALL with kinase gene alterations. But some of the more important prognostic features are actually not based in the biology, but in the response to the treatment. So across the pond in Europe, they use a very low-tech way of deciding whether somebody has a favorable or unfavorable prognosis, and it's worked every single time that they've used it. And that is a response to one week of steroid therapy, nothing else. We just give them some prednisone or dexamethasone for a week. A good response is if you have less than 1,000 blasts in your blood at the end of that, a bad response is if you have greater than 1,000. And this is held up over all of these years. Very low-tech way of looking at this. The other thing is to actually look at how fast somebody goes into remission. So when I do a bone marrow, I'm actually going into the marrow cavity, usually in the hip, taking out some blood, and we're looking at it under a slide. We look at 200 cells. How many cells are in your bone marrow? More than 200, right? Okay. So um, it'd be like Carl Sagan, billions and billions, but we're only looking at 200. And if you have more than 25% of those cells being blast, that's leukemia. If you have less than 5% of those cells being blast, you're in remission. So the speed that you go into remission matters. If you do it rapidly within one to two weeks, that's a favorable prognosis. That means your blasts are sensitive to the chemotherapy. If it takes you longer than that, you still go into remission at the end of 28 days, but it takes you longer than that, you're a slow early responder, that's worse for you. And we know that right up front. 
So then the next thing that we started looking at is 200 cells in billions. Doesn't make much sense to say that you're very accurate with that. So we started looking at different ways of looking deeper at the depth of your remission. So instead of 200 cells, we get to look at 10,000 cells. And to do that, we use two different things. Across the pond, they generally use uh, PCR applications for this. Labor intensive, time intensive to do. Here in the United States, we have really perfected looking at it with flow cytometry. And so able to get a turnaround time within 72 hours, usually 48 hours, 24 hours, of where you stand in that one to 10,000. Still, still not very robust, if you would say, if you're only looking at 10,000, but much better than what we could do before and very predictive. And in fact, this is probably the most predictive of how you're going to do. So right up front, within one month of your diagnosis, we know whether you need increased treatment as a successful strategy or you don't. That MRD is still important later on. If we've intensified your therapy and you still have those cells present at greater than one in 10,000, that means you need an even higher strategy for success. So let's go back to our clinical case for a second. So what kind of, what kind of uh, features did he have that put him at risk? He's greater than 10, he's 14. African he's African American. WBCs are 200,000. And then his flow cytometry reveals that he has T cell ALL. So he hit the trifecta or even more of the trifecta. Okay, so there are differences between pre-B, so B lymphocytes that make your immunoglobulins, right, and T, T lymphocytes that help you with cell-mediated immunity. So in all of ALL for pediatrics, PALL represents about 15% of all cases. They usually have NCI high-risk features greater than 10, white blood cell counts greater than 50,000, usually well over 200,000. My highest one was 1.5 million. Um, they usually have extramedullary disease, and by that we mean mediastinal masses, lots of adenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly. There's an increased incidence in African Americans, and unlike pre-DALL where we look at all of those cytogenetics, there's not truly a clear cytogenetic picture in, in TALL that would help us predict whether you're going to do well or you're not going to do well. Risk-matched TLL fare worse than BALL with the same therapy, and that's what the graph depicts. So in CCG 1991, all ALL patients, whether T or B, got the same therapy. T-cell ALL did much worse than the pre-B ALL. And relapses are very early, usually within the first year um, of diagnosis, and salvage regimens are unsuccessful. unsuccessful. And so usually they have a less than 10% survival after relapse. So we, this is very clearly different than pre-BALL, where you can have relapses for many years after your diagnosis. TALL, usually within 12 to 18 months, if you've made it that far, you're going to make it all the way out. So um, when we realized that T-cell really did do much more poorly, we started looking at using more intensive therapy for just T-cell patients within the ALL group. And the TALL best arms outcome actually came from two groups, pediatric oncology group and CCG, using two incredibly different types of therapies. Same drugs, but used in much different fashions. They both got the exact same results. For those patients with better risk TALL, so standard NCI risk, the event-free survivals were 82.9% and 84.3%. But if you pulled out the very high-risk players, the event-free survivals were much less. And if we look across, um, if we look across all of the trials during this period of time that try to increase uh, intensity of the therapy for T-cell, their five and six-year EFSs or event-free survivals all were in the 60 to 70%. It's, it was not very good. And if you looked at the highest risk, and DSM is a group in Germany that does absolutely fantastic work in leukemia, and they really increased their uh, the intensity of their uh, therapy and actually even gave patients with T-cell disease a bone marrow transplant as a consolidation, and their event-free survival only increased to 67%, and those with chemotherapy had an event-free survival of 42%. So we were getting nowhere fast with T-cell ALL. So the EFS plateaued, 
there was a great need for new agents, new approaches to therapy for these patients. Enter Gertrude Elion. She is one of the heroes of medicine, and probably none of you have ever heard about her. So Trudy is a bio, was a biochemist and a pharmacologist. She got a college degree uh, back um, in a time when women weren't doing that, um, and she applied to try to go on uh, to get uh, a master's and a PhD. She was turned down by all of the, the programs that she applied to. So she became a secretary for a period of time and then decided that, that she really had a drive for, for, for actually cancer um, research as one of her family members had died of cancer. So she went back at night and got a master's and then she applied for a job um, in Dr. Hitchens' lab uh, where she was and he recognized a star when he saw one. So she came to work for him. They worked together and she ended up running his lab. She tried to go back for a PhD but she had to do it at night, and then she would have to quit her job with Dr. Hitchens to be able to do that. She, she decided that was not worth it. She would stay in the lab. Dr. Hitchens went on to work for Burroughs Welcome, took Trudy with him. <clears throat> Trudy developed these drugs that you use every single day. 6-MP, azathioprine, which allowed us to do transplants, allopurinol, pyrimethamine, uh, Bactrim, trimethoprim, acyclovir, and nilarabine and many other drugs. She won, with Dr. Hitchens, the 1988 Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology, one of the few people to have one with just a master's and not with a PhD. She's a true collaborator. She never really worried about who got the credit for anything. What she was interested in is moving knowledge forward. She is one of my heroes in medicine. And thankfully, I got to meet her and work with her. So when I was at Duke, Trudy was there because Burroughs Welcome was in the tri research triangle part, and she was emeritus professor at Duke. She had this tiny little office in the back. And she became friends with my mentor, um, Dr. Kurtzberg, Joanne Kurtzberg. And one day Trudy came to us and she said, um, you know, I have this little compound on the shelf that I think would be really useful, but I haven't been able to do anything with it. Why don't you take it, see what you think you can do? So um, we were off. So that compound was nilarabine, or ARAG. It's a prodrug of ARAG, and it is um, T cell specific because the active metabolite ARAG TP accumulates in T lymphoblasts to a greater extent than in B cells or mature T cells due to decreased ARAG TP degradation. So this should be a fairly specific kind of agent. So then we had to think about how do we put this agent out there? How do we test it? So you have to understand a little bit about how clinical trials for drug therapy um, are conducted. So first, you have to run a phase one. And phase one is how much drug can you give before you see toxicity? We're not looking for a response. We're not looking at a specific cancer. It's how much drug you can give a human being before they get side effects and what kind of side effects are they. So it's given to different types of refractory cancers. You get a rolling number of patients, usually six at each drug dose and no response is expected. Then if it turns out that you can give it safely with a, good, with a good side effect profile and you know how much you can give to a human, then you get a phase two. And that phase two is which particular, particular cancers respond. So you know the dose and you know the dose limiting toxicity, so you give to limited numbers of likely to respond recalcitrant cancers. You find the panel that it works on. Then if you're successful there, and you can imagine how unsuccessful many drugs are as they roll through this, if you're successful there, you can go to phase three. Phase three means, will the drug be better or worse than the current therapy? So you do a head-to-head -head randomized trial with a new agent and the current therapy and decide if it's efficacious. So Dr. Kurtzberg ran the first phase one trial for nilarabine, and it was for adults and for children. Out of that trial, 26 children with relapsed KLL and, lymph and lymphoma, T-cell lymphoma, which is the same disease, just part of the spectrum. She got seven complete responses and four partial responses for a 42% response rate. Unheard of, unseen in any kind of phase one clinical trial. Not only that, responses were seen at all dose levels, from five to 75 milligrams per kilogram. And there was a dose limiting toxicity of neurotoxicity at 60 milligrams per kilogram. So usually you don't see 
this where the drug is useful at every dose that you give. Usually you have to hit a level before the drug is even useful. <clears throat> Very unusual. Unfortunately, <clears throat> the limiting side effect, the neurotoxicity, was very significant. So there was weakness, ataxia, paresthesia, fatigue, confusion, somnolence, and coma. Coma from which people did not recover. So we had an excellent drug, but we had a side effect that would be very concerning to use on patients. But because of the response that patients had, it was deemed okay to go to a phase two. Phase two was run by Dr. Berg at Baylor. And so this was actually just for children. This was not for adults. And so she looked at, she had four stratums. So T cell ALL in first relapse or those that did not go into remission, induction failures. Uh, T cell ALLs who were second or greater relapse, those patients with CNS disease alone, those patients with lymphoma and not true leukemia. She had responses in every single category, incredibly high responses for first relapse and for second relapses, as well as for the lymphoma. Again, highly unexpected. So she took refractory TLL or lymphoma. She found a dose range. She went from 400 to 900 milligrams per meter squared for, per day for five days and determined that the phase two dose that we would use going forward was 650 milligrams per meter squared. She did see some toxicity, 11% grade three or better CNS toxicity, seizure and somnolence, so that was repeated. She had a 9% grade three peripheral neuropathy toxicity, so Guillain-Barre-like syndrome and weakness. But when we went back to look to see if there a way that we could predict who was going to have those kind of symptoms, because those are the bad symptoms, the neurologic events did not vary by stratum by whether they'd had prior cranial irradiation, um, their CNS status, whether they had um, blast in their um, CSS, or any concurrent meds, including IT meds. That means the meds that we give by LP into the intrathecal space. So then um, back to me. So Dr. Kurtzberg um, had gone on to do uh, uh, amazing work in cord blood transplants and decided that that really is where she wanted to focus. And I was getting ready to leave Duke at that time. And so she said, Kim, they want us to run a, a pilot. Why don't you uh, take a look at this? And I was, I was one year out of my fellowship. Um, but I was anxious to get into it. And so um, I happily took on that project. And so um, starting in 2001 and running from two, to 2005, we ran a pilot which was going to look at the feasibility and the safety of incorporating that drug into already a, um, a very robust chemotherapeutic treatment plan with multiple drugs on patients who were not relapsed. These were upfront patients. And everybody was, we were a little nervous because of the toxicity that we had seen in the previous trials, but those were heavily pretreated patients and we were hopeful that we would not see the degree that they had seen before, or at least not more. So we had 88 patients enrolled in Invaluable, 62 males, 26 females, looking exactly like what we'd think, increased males over females. We had four NCI standard risk patients and 84 NCI high risk patients. And so what we did was incorporated nalarabine into a modified BFM backbone. We had a prophase, like we talked about, just giving the prednisone for a week with an IT methotrexate to determine whether they were good responders or not. And then we did induction, consolidation, delayed intensification, maintenance um, in a very standard fashion. And then the larabine was given at either 400 or 650 milligrams per meter squared per day for five days for five or six courses, depending on when they became eligible for the larabine. And we chose that lower dose because we were now giving it with other drugs that had competing neurotoxicities. And if that was going to be unsafe, we wanted to know that first. All patients received cranial radiation prior to maintenance. Um, at a lower dose than was used during that time period for treatment. So the criteria for receiving the were, were was that you had to be a slow early responder, and that definition was you had greater than 1,000 peripheral blood blast on day eight of that prednisone prophase, or you had MRD, that minimal residual disease, greater than 1% at day 36 of induction. Now this is really important because we use this all the time now. This is one of our major ways of determining whether you are going to have to have increased therapy or not. 
this is the very first protocol that ever used this to determine strategy. So we had looked at it before, but we had never used it to change therapy. And we were very nervous about this because we didn't know how that would really play out. So we chose a very high number for minimal residual disease at 1%. Now, we think that um, increasing people's therapy at 0.01% minimal residual disease. So we were hedging our bets and using it only for the most recalcitrant patients. Patients who had that degree of MRD previously during the same time period had an event-free survival of less than 40% for less than 0.1% and less than 14% for the 1%. So we thought that it was reasonable to, um, to risk the neurotoxicity for these patients because the likelihood of their survival from the T-cell LOL if they did not get intensive therapy was very poor. So phase one was a safety only. Those slow early responders could receive the nilarabine. Those who were rapid early responders would receive no nilarabine. So we could compare the toxicities. And in phase two, if we found that it was safe to give, then only the NCI high-risk patients could enroll, and all of them would receive nilarabine regardless of whether they were rapid early responders or slow early responders. So in the trial, the NCI risk groups, we had four standards. Um, three of them did not receive nilarabine, one of them did. We had 84 high risk, and that's what we would anticipate for a T cell group. 71 of those patients received nilarabine, 13 did not. For our induction response, we had 54 rapid early responders, 38 who received nilarabine, 16 who did not. And our MRD positives, that very high MRD, we had eight of those patients and all of them received nilarabine. The patients that were poor responders by prednisone response, 26 of them received nilarabine. So we looked at our targeted neurotoxicities and this was really um, very robustly monitored, like me talking with everybody once a week, basically um, all over the country and in parts of Europe where we ran the trial. So, for um, our targeted neurotoxicities, grade three or greater peripheral neuropathy, we saw a 15% uh, incidence in the patients with nilarabine, zero with those who did not get nilarabine, and a grade three or better central neurotoxicity, 4% with nilarabine, 25% without nilarabine, which was unusual. And I remember I fought with the statistician about why we had to monitor the patients we weren't giving nilarabine to, and remember I was young, um, and he was very wise, and he said, Kim, not always do things happen the way that you think they will, and you need to be able to look at that. So 6% of patients had seizures on the larabine arms, but none were associated with giving them the larabine. Two had a CNS hemorrhage during asparaginase therapy. One had IV ARC in, in combination with um, Paxil and started um, having a seizure then. And one had a staring spell with shift hands, resolved completely not during the larabine. So they agreed with us at CTAP that this was that was an acceptable rate of neurotoxicity we can move forward. So we completed the trial, and then this is a Kaplan-Meier curve that shows you event-free survival over time. Now, um, the five-year survival with nilarabine was 73%, and without nilarabine, 69%. You can see my p-value is not significant. You might say, well, that's a failure, Kim. What are you talking about here? But remember, this study was not powered to look at survival. This was a feasibility study and a toxicity study. but what we did find out is that those patients who really should have had an event-free survival of 40% or 14% actually had an event-free survival of 73%. So it was significant. So the summary from that, T-cell patients with very high-risk features and previously very poor outcomes, EFS less than 40%, attained three-year EFS greater than 70% with no layer beam. There were no significant differences in targeted or non-targeted toxicity in patients treated with or without nilarabine at 400 or 650 milligrams. We piloted both. And NCI high-risk slow responders fared as well as NCI high-risk rapid responders. And this was in contradistinction to what we usually found in our trials. And this was the first protocol to use MRD as a risk stratification to assign treatment. So then we were um, asked to run that phase three trial. So up front, Head to head, what's going to be better, nilarabine or not nilarabine? Now, you have to also understand that when you're running trials for pediatric cancer, while we have a lot of buy-in and, and a lot of patients on trial, there's not a lot of 
patients with pediatric cancer. So we usually try to make our trials very robust. We usually ask at least two questions instead of one, okay? So the study objectives here were to determine the relative safety and efficacy of the addition of nolarabine to that chemotherapy backbone, and we decided to use monotherapy nolarabine um, in six five-day courses at 650 milligrams per meter squared per day. The second thing was to determine the relative safety and efficacy of high-dose methotrexate with leucovorin versus Capizzi-style met methotrexate without leucovorin given in one interim maintenance phase. Now, methotrexate is one of those drugs that's been used for 60 years for this, for treating of ALL. We still don't know how to give it best. There's all kinds of ways to give methotrexate. And one of the beauties of um, collaboration and clinical trial work is you can really ferret out over time what is the best way to give a certain type of drug, even if it's an old drug. Um, so high-dose methotrexate is four or five gram per meter squared doses without asparaginase, and Capizzi is escalating dose. So each 10 days, you give them a slightly higher dose, and they get two doses of PEG during that period of time, but they don't get rescued with leucovorin. So remember that methotrexate is a folate uh, hydroreductase uh, inhibitor, and so you can't, you can't make any more um, reducing substances. So you give them the next step in that enzymatic pathway, you give them folinic acid, uh, folinic acid leucovorin to bypass that. So with Capizzi, you don't do it. You just let everybody ride. But with high dose, you have to or else people would die. Okay, so um, this trial, 0434, um, gave a standard for drug induction. Everybody got the same induction for 28 days. And at the end of 28 days, we evaluated them to see where they were in that risk strategy, and then they got randomized after that to either nilarabine or, or no nilarabine, and second randomization to either methotrexate high dose or methotrexate PZ. So it's very complicated. Don't worry, I see, I see stairs. But, um, but don't worry, I'll go on to explain it a little bit better in a second. So our risk classification, we figured that we would have um, low risk would be about 9% of our population, intermediate risk about 68% of our population, high risk 19% and induction failures 3.4. And their, their risk strategy would be NCI standard risk with no um, extramedullary disease in CNS or testes, and, a, and no MRD at day 29, that's low risk. You're not gonna get nilarabine, and you're not even gonna get a cranial irradiation. That was a new idea for this time period. If you're intermediate risk, you could have any NCI designation. You could have CNS or testicular disease or not, but your MRD had to be between 0.1 and 1%. If you were high risk, same thing applied to you as intermediate, but now your MRD was high. It was greater than 1%. An induction failure means that we gave you those 28 days and we failed to put you in remission. You still had last greater than 25%. Those patients have the lowest EFS of any of our categories. So post-induction, you got the four drugs, you got randomized, you got a consolidation, and in consolidation, if you were randomized to receive nilarabine, you could receive it in consolidation, you could receive it in the delayed intensification, and you received it in the first four maintenance cycles. If you randomize to get um, high-dose methotrexate or Capizzi methotrexate, that, um, that change in your drug therapy only occurred once, and that was an in interim maintenance. So um, the low-risk patients were not part of this randomization. They automatically received no nolarabine, um, and they automatically received only Capizzi methotrexate, um, and they did not receive CNS irradiation. All others, CNS one or two, in any group, so those without CNS disease still received cranial irradiation for prophylaxis so that they would not relapse there, and those who had disease in the CNS received full dose uh, radiation. So we accrued from January 2007 until July 2014. So here's one of the things that you need to know about clinical trials as well. So if you're a clinical researcher, it takes a lot longer than it does um, if you're doing basic lab research. You're not gonna be able to know your answer for many years out, okay? So you have to be patient. Um, we had 1,895 patients, and that is the largest T-cell trial ever to be run in the history of running clinical trials. We had uh, a 1,555 TLL and 282 Hodgkin, oh, excuse me, T-cell uh, T lymphoma patients on trial. 
So we used an intent to treat analysis and assumed an overall baseline post-randomization disease-free survival of 82%. So you have to know what you think is going to happen so you can determine whether you've been successful or not. Our low-risk patients we thought would have an event-free survival of 92%, intermediate risk 86%, and high risk 60% based on previous trials. So we also, because the drug was still, there was concerning neurotoxicity and CTEP was very, and that is the Cancer Therapeutics Program at the NCI, at the National Cancer Institute, who monitors all of our trials. They wanted me to run again, one more time, a safety phase just to make sure that we were very clear that we were, that this would be safe for patients to enroll on. So we did, and in the safety phase, we looked at those targeted neuropathies again, uh, peripheral motor and sensory neuropathies. We found that in our induction failure patients, we had a 12.5% incidence of motor neuropathy, and on all arms, 8%, and on our induction failure arm, 5% sensory, and on all arms, 11%. And the reason why we've carved out that induction failure are those patients were non-randomly assigned to get the highest therapy. That means both high-dose methotrexate and nalarabine. So they got the most therapy that anybody could get on the, on the trial. And we looked at our, our, our lymphoma patients for that as well. They were not randomized to get high-dose methotrexate, so they could only get the escalating-dose methotrexate. And their um, neuropathies incidences were also within range. 4.3% for motor, 7.1% for sensory. And if you recall, in the phase two study, we're looking at a 9% range. And in the um, pilot study, which incorporated nalarabine into the chemotherapy backbone, it was a 15% neuropathy rate. So we were well within all of that. So they agreed that we could go forward. The other thing that they wanted us to look at was the actual dose intensity, because we are intending to give the nalar being at full dose, but because of neuropathy, people may be falling out. So we need to know that what we're thinking, um, that we're monitoring, the neuropathy from nalar being is actually there as they move forward in the protocol. And so on arm B, which had nalar being, there were 24 patients um, that we looked at uh, prior to stopping the study and looking at their neuropathy for six months. Um, 15 of them um, were able to get full nalar being exposure. That's 30 doses each. Um, there were nine patients who were not able to get all 30 doses, but the majority of them were able to get um, at least half of their doses. And if you looked at the received versus possible, it was a 76% intensity rate, meaning they got 76% of the doses. So we felt like the toxicities we were seeing were accurate and able to be monitored for longer periods of time. If you looked at arm D, which also had no layer being, same thing, 23 patients were in the, that arm. 15 of them received full no, no air being exposure, um, and eight of them did not. But the received possible, so the intensity, dose intensity was 82%. Again, CTAP deemed that this was okay to carry forward into a, a wide open trial now. We did, however, have two cases of the severe uh, neuropathy. Um, and so case one was a, uh, was a young girl uh, in consolidation who had multiple medical complications prior to and during receiving her nalarabine. Um, after her first course of nalarabine, she became persistently encephalopathic off study on 818 and then died um, in September from um, actually recurrent disease. The case two was a, was a young boy, um, also received this in consolidation, had fevers, neuropathic pain, and then persistently encephalopathic um, since July 2014 without uh, a lot of neurologic recovery. So we had two cases of the severe neurotoxicity that we were seeing that had been described previously. In April 2015, our monitoring rules were met, and let me describe that a little bit. Every clinical trial actually has stopping rules. So they're monitored constantly by the statisticians, by the NCI. And so if you reach a place where it's either unsafe or you reach a place where it is clear that one of the arms is clearly better than the other, the trial has to stop. You have to tell the patients who are on that trial, and then you have to go back and treat those on the trial if you can, if they're at a place where they can be treated, to give them the best arm, to give them the best chance. And we do this all the time in COG. So we have to talk with our patients who go on trial, and if we find out anything new, we have to inform them of what it is, 
and try to go back and give them that kind of therapy. So we had a planned interim analysis of about 1,000 patients on trial at that point. And those who had received the escalating dose methotrexate, 518, there were 19 events, 11 relapses, three second malignancies, five deaths in complete remission. And of the 11 relapses, seven were bone marrow, no CNS involvement, and four with CNS involvement. But on the high dose methotrexate arm, again, 513 patients with very equal arms, there were 30 events. So 24 relapses, one second malignancy, five uh, deaths in CR, and of the 24 relapses, 14 with no CNS involvement, 10 with CNS involvement. So at that point, COG by Statistics Center said it was statistically impossible for high-dose methotrexate to demonstrate superiority. So we stopped that arm. So if you look at the four-year disease-free survival, for the Capizzi methotrexate, it was 92.5%. For the high-dose methotrexate, 86%. For an overall uh, event-free survival of 89%, the highest that's ever been seen in T-cell disease particularly for those patients who have intermediate or high-risk disease using chemotherapy alone. Well, this is unusual because this is not what we would found when we looked at it in the pre-B section or in any other T-cell trial that had gone before us. Everybody else had always found that high-dose methotrexate was superior to capizzi methotrexate. And so we were the lone out of five trials who looked at this, we were the lone performer who showed that Capizzi methotrexate was better. So we had to look at that. We had to decide why is that true? Um, and this is the important part about looking at clinical trials and confounders. So we went back and we looked at um, what's different, truly different about those two arms, the Capizzi and the high-dose methotrexate. And what, if you lay them out, and IND is induction, consolidation, interim maintenance, DI, and maintenance, and then the yellow markers are for asparaginase dosing, um, the arrows, either green or teal, I love that color teal, um, are for high-dose methotrexate or capizzi dosing, and that white block is where they receive cranial irradiation. You can see that it wasn't just the methotrexate that was different about these two arms, right? I mean, your, your four-year-old child could pick out that there was something different here, okay? So, um, so one of them got irradiation much early in their therapy, and one of them, the same one, got more doses of asparaginase in their therapy. So then we overlaid where the relapses occurred during that type of therapy. And it was obvious that most of the relapses, all of the relapses, occurred on the capizzi arm after the radiation. So, uh, excuse me, excuse me, let me take that back. That you had, <laughs> you had none before the radiation and you had fewer as uh, compared to the high-dose methotrexate after the irradiation. So zero events before CRT, four CNS, two isolated, seven medullary after CRT. In the high-dose methotrexate, you had six CNS, two isolated, and four medullary before cranial irradiation. So we were seeing a higher, a higher number of patients relapse earlier on the high-dose methotrexate arm with the, with the confounder being that they received their radiation much later. And they also received less doses of asparaginase. So we went back um, and looked at whether there was any difference in our MRD, because MRD is our surrogate. If you have high MRDs, you should be failing. If you have low MRDs, you should not be failing. And so when we looked at the post-induction disease-free survival for high-dose methotrexate, looking at MRDs, and, and so the highest MRDs are those in blue, the lowest MRDs are those in black, you can see that for the, um, for the high-dose methotrexate arm, it was, it was what we would expect. As you had increasing MRD, you had increasing failure. But if you look at the MRD for the Capizzi methotrexate, that didn't play out anymore. We had done something, we had changed something about how we could predict um, prognosis. So that the MRDs that were, were grouping before very nicely based on increasing MRD, now they were all grouped together. So even if you had medium range MRD, high MRD, you were still surviving at the same rate. And actually only until you got down to a 10% MRD for the Capizzi methotrexate did you actually drop off into the really poor failure range. So clearly different than what we had seen before. So we went back and looked at both things, 
what happens when you give PALL more, uh, more asparaginase? So our colleagues across the pond in, uh, in the UK had looked at that, and they had seen that escalating methotrexate associated with numerically better outcomes using that approach, where uh, methotrexate is given without leucoborin and high-dose methotrexate is given with leucoborin. So perhaps there, was a, there is an advantage to not giving leucoborin at all, which you can't do with a high-dose methotrexate. It, it allows you to have a longer time under the curve to attack those blasts, okay? You don't rescue the blast by giving them leucoborin. And that there's a different efficacy of asparaginase in regimens in B cell and T cell. So many studies uh, have actually looked at that, at the Dana-Farber, um, some of our colleagues in Europe, and the more um, asparaginase doses that are given for T cell, it's consistent with increasing survival. So it might not just be the methotrexate, it might be that we gave them more doses of asparaginase. <laughs> then the second thing is the differential timing of cranial radiation, um, and it could have influenced outcome. In the children's cancer group, who used the same backbone, both studies gave radiation within the first two weeks of consolidation very early on, like we did for that one arm, and um, they had suggested in two of their trials that early CNS control may prevent bone marrow relapse. And the way they thought that they did that was that they decreased the sanctuary site. So T lymphoblasts and B lymphoblasts will travel all over. They can get into your CNS, and when they do, it's difficult to deliver drugs that way there. And so it's a sanctuary site. So they could grow, proliferate, and then go back into the marrow. So that was one of the theories about why early cranial irradiation may be helpful for um, bone marrow relapse as well. So in summary, PLL treated with uh, 0434 therapy has an excellent outcome. So PZ methotrexate or escalating dose is superior to high dose methotrexate um, in TLL treated with COG augmented therapy the way that we did it. This is important too. You can't just say it is one uh, or the other. It, you can't change a drug regimen and just use higher dose methotrexate within a different drug regimen. It has to be this one. You can't take these modules out and just place them where you want to. And I think that's important to remember when you're using any kind of therapy. You have to really look at how the trials use the drug and use it in the same manner to get the same results. In the context of 0434, early exposure to cranial radiation and dose intensified asparaginase may have contributed to relapse prevention. And right now, we don't even know if ARG is effective or not. So we're hopeful. Remember, we started this trial back in 2010. I will probably have that data in this upcoming year. So I will not even know yet whether ARG and nilarabine made a difference yet or not. But the nice thing about these trials is even though you're waiting for a long time to look at outcome, you can also do a lot of other science um, and learn a lot of things. And so um, we were actually very interested in looking at a specific form of TALL, which is very deadly, and it's called early thymic precursor, ETP, um, TALL. And groups across the world had decided that this, this particular type of TALL um, was recalcitrant to therapy. So it is described as one of the earliest precursors of the T lymphocyte, and it's defined by a flow cytometry panel. So they are CD1A negative, CD8 negative, CD5 weak, and they look like mixed, uh, mixed leukemias, like both AML and ALL, because they will have myeloid markers and stem cell markers on them. So we think those are the earliest precursors um, as they go down um, their progression. And then there is a group called near ETP, which meets that criteria but has a slightly elevated CD5. So we were interested in looking at what happens to these very bad performers using this kind of chemotherapy. Previously at St. Jude's, they had described that in their chemotherapy that these actually had an event-free survival of only 22%, so they're poorest performers. And we were also interested in looking at um, what, what might make them different. So with colleagues at St. Jude's, Dr. Charles Mulligan and others, we were actually able to do whole genome sequencing on all of these patients and look for the things that might be turned on or turned off that might make um, their, um, that might determine why they are doing so poorly. 
And we found a frequency of somatic alterations targeting hematopoietic and lymphoid development in ETP and non-ETP TLL, showing an increased frequency in those, those very um, targeted hematopoietic and lymphoid development uh, genes for the ETP. And this was published in Nature, and we published that a few years ago. So we looked at our outcomes and we saw that we had a, we had a large number of ETP patients, probably the largest number ever to be studied. Um, and we had a frequency of 11.3% of our population with ETP and 17 with near ETP, 71.6 not ETP at all. And that those patients that had ETP or near ETP had um, a higher frequency of having higher MRD at day 29. So they looked like they would be recalcitrant and that they had a higher level of being an induction failure, meaning that we couldn't even treat them in the first 28 days and they still had greater than 25% blast. But if we look at our survivals for all of those groups, they're exactly the same. So ETP, near ETP, not ETP. 82.9, 84.7, 86.9%, and for your overall survival in the 90s. So the worst players had exactly the same and even better event-free survival. And this just depicts the um, event-free survival um, of ETP near ETP, not ETP, and shows how, what a contrast it was to what the historical controls had been. So we also decided to look at MRD and make sure, um, one of the things that you'd like to know is that if you have a high MRD at the end of 29 days, if you do something different, if you increase their therapy, does it change? Does it change what you can do? Can you predict who's gonna survive? by increasing intensity or not. And what we found is those patients that had high MRD at day 29, so should be four performers, if we intensified them, what happened at the end of consolidation in another eight weeks? If they had an end of induction consolidation MRD of less than 0.1%, they actually performed quite well and had event-free survivals of greater than 80%. However, if we could not get that MRD to go away at that point in time, they had very poor survival. So it predicts a group that needs something even more, like a stem cell transplant at that point to increase their survival. So conclusions for that, TLL treated with 0434 therapy has an excellent outcome. There's no difference in outcome for the very worst performers, ETP versus non-ETP. Um, even though they have a higher day 29 MRD and a higher induction failure rate, the utility of MRD as a risk stratification was confirmed. We know that day 29 predicts a poor risk patient, but end of consolidation is even more problematic, and those patients need to be treated with stem cell transplant or another type of therapy. And treatment response is more important than subtype. So conclusions for biology, TLL is distinctly different from pre-B, pre, from pre predominance of NCI high-risk features, but doesn't conform to NCI risk strategies. There's no true genetic prognostic identifiers but that may be changing as we become more adept at learning what those hematopoietic genes turning on and off do. And minimal residual disease at end of induction and end of consolidation are the most important risk stratifiers. Treatment outcomes, TLL confers a worse prognosis in trials treating both T and B on the same protocols, but it's responsive to intensified therapies and new agents. We have the highest ever event-free survival for TCL, TALL, especially those who, are, um, who had been previously poor performers. It has a different response to chemotherapeutic agents compared to pre-BALL, both for nilarabine, methotrexate, and asparaginase. ETP, or very early um, precursor, does not confer a worse prognosis. Relapses are early and usually non-salvageable, and new innovative therapies are still needed. We're still not done. So the newest trial, um, which I sit on the committee but I don't share this time, um, is done by David Peachy at CHOP. Um, and so they are looking at using the same chemotherapy backbone but adding in a bortezomib, which is a proteasome inhibitor. And the reason why they're not using nilarabine or anything else is we have to leapfrog. So we, I won't know the results until this year. We started this chemotherapy protocol two years ago. So we have to kind of leapfrog through so that we're always, hopefully, at the cutting edge of the next technology. My thankfulness slide, which I think is really important, uh, COG, COG, LL committee, Joanne Kurtzberg, my mentor, Trudy Elligan, my hero. Stuart Winter was my fellow at, at Duke, and he is the person who co-chairs the 0434 
um, study with me. All of my colleagues at UVA, which allowed me the time uh, to put effort into this kind of study, and that's another thing that I think is important, the collaboration of your colleagues that allow you to support your different missions. And then all of the children and families who make this kind of work meaningful. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks so much for your talk. So, we know Larabine has a side effect profile that some of these patients have severe neurotoxicity. Yes. Have you thought about genotyping to try to figure out how nalarabine is metabolized and maybe we have some genetically vulnerable patients that need a lower dose, just like with TPMT genotyping? Absolutely. So uh, that's a wonderful question. And um, we work very heavily with Mary Riley at St. Jude's, who is a huge Farbico, um genomics person and I think has more um, knowledge about drugs and drug metabolism than anybody um, that I know. She actually is looking at um, profiling these patients so that we can look at that. Um, that'll be a separate um, uh, manuscript paper as we, as we look at that analysis, but that's a perfect thing. Kim, this is a great reminder about how complex it is to get a drug to market and to figure it out whether it works. I was really surprised about the study design, just as a very basic question, that there were so there's such differences in the two arms to start with. Why wasn't that looked at at the beginning? If you're asking two questions, you threw in so many variables. Uh, exactly, and let me tell you that it's like making sausage when you're going to um, one of these um, drug committees and trying to write out a protocol. So we had much conversation about that, and I actually wanted them to be exactly the same. But for us to be able to look at capizine methotrexate, that escalating dose, our colleagues who were, um, had used this in CCG were adamant that we had to give radiation up front because they knew that they would have failures if they didn't. And we wanted it to be a safe trial for patients. We can't give radiation up front if we're gonna give high dose methotrexate. And so that was a variable that we, we just couldn't, we couldn't change between the two arms. And um, I look back at it now and think that I should have had I should have had a more um, vocal opinion about how we were going to go through that design. Um, but again, this was the first time we were going to use this drug in a, um, which had significant considerations of toxicity. And people wanted to do what they thought would be the safest thing for the patients along the way. But it's important to point that out. So you were, uh... You were commenting that the MRD makes a big difference. So the high-dose methotrexate patients on that, on that arm of the trial, did previous studies always have it so that the radiation was after the high-dose methotrexate? Always. You can't give high-dose, you can't cranially radiate somebody and then give high-dose methotrexate. You have the complication of leukoencephalopathy. And so, um, so we learned that through previous trials. Any other questions? One other to follow up on that question. Um, in the previous studies with the Capizzi, was that also after the therapy? Yes. So, gotcha. Yes. Any other questions in the room? All right, give me one second. I know we have a ton of people online. I just want to make sure they have an opportunity. All right. I'm going to try this again. If you are on the line and you do not want us to hear your background conversations or anything like that, just please put your phone on mute right now. The conference is now in talk mode. Okay, so the phone lines are unmuted. Does anyone have a question or want to make a comment? <laughs> Crickets. Crickets, okay. that's okay. That means you answered all the questions. Okay, uh, I think that wraps us up. Thank you awesome. very much. Thank you.